Welcome to Silicon Valley Business, a show focused on highlighting the innovation and heart of Silicon Valley. I am your host, Oscar Garcia, and today's topic is on education. Welcome, uh, Nick and David. Really appreciate you being on the show. Thank you for having it's us. Good, for be, good to be here. So, uh, so um, before we kick things off, you know, with some <clears throat> questions on this really amazing uh, collaborative between Santa Clara University and the uh, Institute of Hispanic um, uh, Advance, and we do have a short video clip that we're going to show right now that uh, will give a high level overview. So we'll watch it now. Very good. Great. We're putting together an alliance of educational entities to address a very serious societal challenge, and that's educating Latinos. Santa Clara University, and specifically our School of Education and Counseling Psychology, is going to be starting our teacher preparation program in East San Jose. Santa Clara should have a role of service in the Silicon Valley, and we should channel our resources and our opportunities to partner with people who are making a difference. A good teacher can change the lives of every student in his or her class. If a child can't learn the way we teach, maybe we should teach the way they learn. You're witnessing today the group that's coming together to form the alliance that's going to make a difference with Latinos, students, families, and communities. Because the vision is out there. And it is up to all of us to make sure that that vision becomes a reality. Our teachers and training will be going out to the communities that we'll be working with in East San Jose, among others, uh, visiting the schools, the communities, talking to teachers, talking to parents, talking to students, so they can have a very real first-hand sense of what the issues and the needs are in that community. It's important that these institutions come together because it's going to take a lot of us and the entire community to make a difference. We need to make sure that we bridge the achievement gap so these kids don't show up for high school one or two years behind in grade level in reading and math. My hope is to go to um, like an Ivy League school or something like that. I don't know which one, but I plan to go there and I want to study oncology. It's unfair to the student if you set a low bar for them and you have low expectations because they want to achieve, they want to learn, they want to contribute. This is an effort to uh, increase the uh, not just the outreach, but the practices that are necessary in the classroom to improve instruction. A culturally responsive teacher is a teacher who begins where the students are and doesn't make any presuppositions or assumptions about a student's ability to learn or not to learn. That's very fundamental. My favorite teacher is Ms. Chavoya. She's my geometry teacher. She tries her best to um, to help everyone learn in the best possible way that they can learn. Mr. Sobrato has been incredibly generous to us at Santa Clara University, but also for the work that's been done here in East San Jose. John Sobrato is a great builder. He has built great buildings, and now we're building educational institutions. He understands the needs of this underserved Latino community. It's been a commitment of his for some time. I salute Santa Clara University for taking on this uh, challenge, this opportunity to make sure that we're educating teachers to meet the needs of all children in our schools. It's the kind of work we're supposed to be doing and we're doing it. Nick, uh, tell us uh, about this uh, unique collaboration. Well, it's an amazing collaboration between three primary groups, Santa Clara University, the Institute for Hispanic Educational Advancement, and two charter schools uh, that are all located in the same place all of whom are dedicated to serving underserved Latino populations, children and their families. And from Santa Clara's perspective, it's our teacher preparation program. How, what are the best practices for educating teachers and making sure that teachers are, in turn, uh, providing the best teaching opportunities for students? Mm -hmm. Now, what are some of the uh, challenges and opportunities uh, that you've seen in uh, educating Latino youth today? Well, I think there are a variety of challenges. We know that uh, many of the school systems that are currently uh, in existence are underfunded. They, we don't know what works best with uh, these populations. So what we need to do is figure out how, what are the best uh, practices. Um, with poverty or with uh, lack of uh, resources in schools, those are huge challenges to overcome. Moreover, we really haven't looked at what makes for the best teacher in relation to serving 
uh, Latino students. And because of that, uh, s many of the students can't get the kind of services or can't get the kind of teaching experiences that many others uh, are able to obtain. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, when I was uh, reading about this uh, collaborative, uh, I came across uh, the uh, phrase culturally responsive teachers. Mm -hmm. Tell us what that means. Well, a culturally responsive teacher does a few things. Uh, when you think back to your favorite teacher, what is that teacher able to do? Well, that teacher is able to empathize with you, understand you, demonstrate that he or she understands you, and then a is able to find where your the learning misstep is or the learning that needs to take place and goes after that. Uh, what we have is right now in, in this region, we have about 13,500 teachers, only 10% of whom are bilingual. And only half of those are bilingual bicultural. So we have a real gap between what students are experiencing in their day-to-day -day mm -hmm. life and the teachers that could understand those experiences. Mm, okay. Now, David, um, you are, uh, if I'm correct, heading up the Institute of Hispanic uh, Educational Advancement, correct? correct. Exactly. Um, what is the Institute's role in this collaborative? Well, first of all, it's an exciting time for us to have this collaborative, and thank you for having us. We're working together with Santa Clara University. The NHU Foundation is leading this, and, and we're working with our charter high schools. We're in this for the research policy and practice that will improve the education of Latino students, parents, and community. And it's gonna take many entities to do this. Currently, we have the three organizations working hard to make that happen. So we're looking at the practice, which is Santa Clara's teacher education program. It's also the charter schools that we have in place today, Latino College Prep, the Luis Valdez Leadership Academy, and soon we will have a K-8. So we're gonna have K-12 on that campus in Eastside where we can actually identify, as Nick said, those best practices in kindergarten, third grade, eighth grade. Why? Because kindergarten's very important mm -hmm. in terms of preparing the children. Children need to learn to read by third grade because they read fourth grade content. Anybody in here that's from California knows about fourth grade missions. I'm sure if you were oh, yes. educated, you probably remember the mission you studied. I do. Let me test you. <laughs> <laughs> There's, we, we have to learn to read by fourth grade. And eighth grade algebra is key. It's, a, it's, a, it's an indicator of how they're gonna succeed in high school and into college. So we wanna make sure that we're having the best research data-driven practices, as Nick said, so that we can inform the teacher education program at Santa Clara, and Santa Clara can inform the best practice. So th those are the kinds of practices that we want to implement. We want to do the research to determine that those are the best practices, and then we want to disseminate this. Latinos today are the fastest growing group in the United States, 53 million. One in five under the age of 17 are Latino students in schools. That number in 2040 will be, 2030 will be one in four. So this problem is getting larger, it's getting more acute. So I would like to commend Santa Clara and all of our partners that are involved in this, including the public schools, which are Eastside Union High School District, the Eastside Alliance, that are the seven charters feeding in. We're all in this together to figure out what is gonna work best with educating Latino getting those parents involved and empowering those parents and serving the community. So it's an exciting time, Oscar. Sounds like a very uh, uh, exciting. Now, you earlier you mentioned N uh, NHU. For uh, our audience who might not be familiar uh, with that acronym, if you can tell us uh, what NHU. NHU is the, is the foundation. It's called the NHU Foundation, formerly the National Hispanic University that had been around for 32 years. We're continuing that tradition of teacher education. The National Hispanic University prior to all of this, for two decades, trained teachers. The founder, Dr. Cruz, was an educator that believed in doing something different and figuring out how do we prepare teachers to be effective with this growing demographic. He was way ahead of his time 30 years ago. So this partnership continues to grow. He's no longer with us, and the NHU University is now transitioning, but we're in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. We try something, we learn from it, we grow, we start up, we move. I mm -hmm. love the fact that people are energetic about this, and guess what? We are going to address one of societal's major challenge, how we educate Latinos. And from a business perspective, Oscar, if we don't have teachers and parents working together to educate these kids, who's going to be the workforce? That's right. We mm -hmm. need to make sure that these students are educated, that they become part of the workforce, that they're contributors, if we're going to continue to compete. And guess what? It's not just here in California. The fastest growing city, proportionally speaking for Latinos, is Raleigh, North Carolina. So this is a national challenge. Right. So we'll have implications across the nation. And again, I want to thank Nick, and I want to thank Father, Father Ng, 
and all of the Santa Clara family for stepping out of their comfort zone to get involved in something like this. And I think other universities need to take a lead from what Santa Clara is doing here and step out of their comfort zones because they need to become part of the solution, mm -hmm. not part of the problem. Right. Well, and, and you're right, uh, David, to what you mentioned it is, uh, as I mentioned uh, uh, before to, to you, Nick, uh, when we initially spoke, is, is that one of the things that uh, caught me about what Santa Clara University is doing is the fact that it's an institution that's been around for many, many years, for a long time, and typically uh, education institutions tend to be more conservative. Uh, they're not out. Um, so much known for innovation and the fact that Santa Clara University is um, doing this collaborative uh, it's certainly something to be committed to the entire to you and the entire leadership and mm -hmm. everyone else in the community that is uh, part of this so congratulations well thank you I think universities traditionally uh, are compared to icebergs in their movement <laughs> uh, but one of the things we've decided and especially since we're in Sil Silicon Valley how can we not innovate mm -hmm. how can we not look to transform how we do things because frankly the system is broken uh, the education system has a lot of problems, and what we're trying to do is say, okay, how do we fix those problems? Not let, let's not be the 1950s school mm -hmm. of education. Let's mm -hmm. be the 2020 school of education. That's a model for the country. Right. And you know, uh, having myself um, been and uh, worked in the business sector, I sometimes look at some of these issues in education from a um, customer service standpoint, mm -hmm. and I think to myself, um, if, <coughs> if I was running a, a, a company, my company, and my customers had a demand for, for whatever that new service is. I have two choices, either provide that service to uh, what my customers are asking or not do it and potentially go out of business. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I think uh, some of our um, uh, educational institutions and other government institutions don't look at the, who they serve as their customer. Uh, for myself, I grew up here in Mountain View, and I translated for my parents during parent-teacher conferences. 30 plus years uh, <coughs> later, when we got involved with my family and friends and started the uh, nonprofit Mesa de la Comunidad, it was because of the fact that I saw there was still no translation right. in my old elementary school, even though the population of the Latino students had increased tremendously. You know, so yeah. again, I, I commend you. And I think that's that's an excellent point because <clears throat> in my former life. As professor, I started a program with a colleague of mine called Poder de los Padres, and we had done it for a few years, and it was really empowering the parents to get involved in the process, because I think schools have a lot to learn from the parents. Sometimes parents don't know how to express themselves, sometimes they don't speak English. We need to make sure that they are valued, that they are, uh, there's an opportunity for them to have input, mm -hmm. and we have to empower them. With that empowerment comes responsibility yes. and accountability. So we're not only going to hold the teachers responsible and accountable, we want to hold the parents accountable. And guess what? They want that. That's right. Latino parents want the best education for their kids. Mm -hmm. And we're going to provide this through this collaborative. Mm -hmm. We'd like to create a prototype that's not only an education ecosystem, but a community ecosystem mm -hmm. where the parents and businesses, Oscar, and invite you and all of the members of the uh, chamber to be part of this, that's to right. contribute to this because I think we're coming up with something here that's gonna really transform yes. and innovate. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we can operate uh, as, a, as a silo. Uh, even, uh, you know, at, at, at my chamber, and yes, Chamber Commerce of Mountain View, but what we do and what other organizations do, other chambers and other, uh, in other cities, it really has a ripple effect. Sure. And again, it's not just, you know, only focused on, on Mountain View, to your point as well, that you need to bring other right. organizations together. Let me ask you this. Um, what do you say to those folks that say, well, why do you have to create a, a separate institution uh, for Latino students? Why can't you do it at a public institution or with uh, mainstream students? Why create something separate? Do you want to take that? Right I'll start with this notion of a lot of times public <coughs> institutions uh, use a deficit model to understanding children. So you get children who are bilingual or only speak Spanish. It's like, oh my gosh, they only speak Spanish. That's, that's, we got to fix that as if that's a deficit or a problem. Rather than look at bilingualism as a strength 
for, uh, to embrace mm -hmm. and to understand. I mean, going back growing up, I came from an immigrant family, and, and there were four languages spoken in my home. And I, and I remember early on uh, being told, you know, uh, by teachers, you know, we got to, or my parents were told, stop having him learn other languages because it's messing up his English, <laughs> rather than, than embracing it. And, and as a result, I stopped learning other languages, and I ended up focusing on English. I learned English great, but I wasn't able to communicate with my grandparents. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge loss. And I think sometimes we set up these deficit models that from the start are doomed to <coughs> fail. That's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. And just from a practical standpoint, Latinos are lagging very far behind their counterparts, the uh, white and Asian, in terms of academic achievement, college uh, dropout rates, college going rates. So something has to be done that's unique, different, innovative, and bold. Mm -hmm. So again, I have to congratulate Santa Clara and others that are coming to the table to say, how can we do something different for this demographic, for this fastest growing population in California and the nation? So it, again, it's gonna take innovative, creative people that are open-minded, that are willing to work, and also people that look at things differently. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we easily dismiss things as, oh, that's not as good. Oh, maybe they can't do it. Oh, the parents don't care. You know, it's, we can't do that anymore. We have to start looking at things in the 20, 21st century. This is Silicon Valley. We need to innovate here, mm -hmm. and we need to have an open mind. I mean, your parents, Oscar, I mean, they did so obviously a great job with you and the rest of your family. I know when you were recognized at, the, at that event for the Hispanic Heritage Foundation, I was really uh, proud to see your family being recognized. But there are a lot of families out there that want to do the same. We've got to just create that mechanism for them to actually achieve that. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're all about here. Mm -hmm. No, it's true. Now, I understand that the uh, one of the, the roles uh, of the um, uh, uh, is that also some advocacy in public policy? Is that, is correct. that correct? Mm -hmm. correct? Maybe, David, you can... Yeah, well, what we'd like to do here, again, is come up with those best practices, the research, so that we can continue to influence policies and practices, not only within our own institutions, because we're, we are institutions and we're learning, right, within the institution. How do we share that policy and practice with others? Just like on this show tonight, I hope other universities are watching this and seeing Santa Clara step up and say, maybe we ought to be pushing the envelope a little bit. You know, we have this large demographic, 51% of the students in California schools are Hispanic. Maybe we ought to be doing something a little different. So again, it, we want to influence that. We want to have those conversations. You know, we, we've got to stop looking at things in a way that's, like you were saying earlier, from the past. Mm -hmm. We've got to look into the future. Mm -hmm. And all of our institutions have to do that. So the way you do that is you influence policy, you get in front of policymakers, uh, politicians, people that are elected, and others, and business, and say, here's what we have to offer. We need your help, and we can help you. Mm -hmm. and we recently had a meeting with Apple and said, this is what we're doing. And they got all excited, say, how, do we, how can we do this? How can we partner with you to help out? Now, sure, there's a business component to that, but, but Apple's on the right track. They understand that, th that serving a community that's been traditionally underserved has an advantage in the long term. Right. Mm -hmm. It's that long term thinking we're looking at. Mm -hmm. The other thing I want to say about just children and how children are seen sometimes, it's like those children are not my child. I think a standard of education is what do you accept for your child? If that standard is not met, then the schools of education have failed, the education systems have failed. That should be true for all children. We should be seeing all children as our children. As soon as we do that, we refocus, our lens shifts, mm -hmm. and we're able to look at education differently. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's true, no, you're right. I wanna go back uh, to what you mentioned about Apple and you know some of the, uh, <coughs> on the video, uh, Sobrato uh, Family Foundation uh, mm -hmm. supporting this. So what, what is, tell me a little bit more about the role of the business community in this, either what they're currently doing or what you would want them to, to do uh, in, in, the, in the future. Well, I, you know, as you mentioned, John Sobrato and the, his foundation has been very supportive and helped us with the building, helped us with our educational programming. We, he's been a standard and a pillar in the community for us for some time. Um, and as I mentioned, Apple is there, but we do need other help. I mean, we do need to look at what are mm -hmm. the ways that we can innovate and try to change how we educate. So we hope that other business uh, members are looking to find out um, how, do we, how do we create or how do we uh, instead of going overseas, which I think is not a necessarily a bad thing, we've got a community right here that mm -hmm. we can educate. We don't have to go very far. Imagine mm -hmm. the money we invest 
in K-1 visas and getting people from other countries to come here to be engineers or to be in the STEM sciences. We have kids right here who want this and need this education. And if we can grow them at home, right. all the better. Yes. Yeah, I, think, I think John's a real leader and a visionary when he says things. He was at this press conference at the, 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 at the event uh, on June 20th, and he said something I think was very critical. He talked about the lagging uh, educational achievement of Latinos, but he also said, when you stop to think about it from a business perspective, it takes us $50,000 to keep somebody in prison and $8,000 to keep them in school. <laughs> Where do we put our money? And again, it's putting the money up front so that we can educate people and make them contributors. So again, I think John's a visionary. I think the other people in the, in the business community need to look at how they can participate in making things better for our community. Mm -hmm. And he's one of them. His whole family, the foundation's done a great job at Santa Clara and other institutions. And so it, we need more people like John Sobrato and others. Right. No, every year in January, um, uh, Joint Ventures comes out with their annual report <coughs> of the Valley, and um, they do, uh, at least for the last three, four, five years, I've been talking about the lack of skilled workforce here. And in fact, Silicon Valley constantly is talking about that. Sure. And uh, what you're saying, Nick, is we have acres of diamonds to, you know, mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. in, a, in our own backyard here of students and the potential here, so absolutely. Now, tell us, uh, Nick, about the, from um, the education standpoint in terms of the students, because uh, what I understand is that you can get your teaching credential and I believe a master's through this program. Absolutely, one of the unique features of Santa Clara's our School of Education, our teacher education program is you can get your master's and your credential in one year. You could go two years, but one year out of undergraduate, you can get that. Moreover, if you commit to working in an underserved Latino community uh, in East San Jose, East Palo Alto, we will cover at least half your tuition. It's wow. a great deal. Yes. Uh, you know, I wish going back I could have had that kind of deal. <laughs> um, but it, it competes from a dollar's perspective with every local university or college. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, it's a better deal than most. Uh, and so I think that this special program that we've developed, uh, again, demonstrates our social justice commitment as a school and as a university. Wow, that's, uh, that is. Putting uh, our money where our mouth yeah, is, no, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, and, and then uh, in terms of recruiting the students to go through this program, how is, uh, how are you going about well, I, doing I think one of the things, and again, it's partnerships with Eastside Union High School District and the Alliance, which are those seven school districts that feed in, we're going to work closely with them so that they can obviously and hopefully identify some people that they feel are very talented that they'd like to see become teachers, like instructional aides or other classified staff. We want to make sure that there's an opportunity because who better than the people that live in that community to serve that community, right? We also will be starting a charter high school the uh, Roberto Cruz Leadership Academy, where we're gonna identify kids as early as ninth grade to put them on an academic pathway to be teachers. So all is going on in the short term, longer term, and a lot of that recruitment's gonna be taking place. And it's, uh, again, Santa Clara has some great outreach people to, to, to work, but it's, again, working with partners so that they can provide some resources, some insights. And those, those public schools, those uh, districts are very important in this process. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm going to pretend I'm a venture capitalist here, and you're coming to me uh, to ask you to, to write a check to support um, this initiative here. And I'm, I'm convinced the need is there, uh, absolutely. And we have the, the demographics and population and so forth. But um, other organizations, other institutions have tried to address this same issue that you are. What makes you think you're going to be successful? That's a very good question. I, you know, I have, uh, we've talked a lot about this idea mm -hmm. that failure is not an option. That we don't, if we fail, that is such a, that would be so devastating, that would be a, a system-wide failure. And so we take the approach as we're going to find a way to succeed. If it doesn't, if we go one direction, it doesn't work, we'll course correct and go another direction. But so I think part of it is the attitude, is that we don't take failure as an option. Once you take that away, and I think that's how why partly others have failed. So give me the money, and if we fail, ah, it doesn't matter, we've spent the money. And I think that's been kind of the pattern in education, in higher education in particular, when they've ventured out into endeavors like, such as this. Whereas what we're saying is, no, it's, it's got to work. If it doesn't work this way, then we have to course correct and find out what does work. So the idea that you can have a high school, a research institute, 
and a teacher preparation program all in the same building already sets us apart and puts us ahead of the game. And I think once we're there, then it's communication and collaboration. If one of our teachers aren't succeeding, then I want to hear that from the high school principal. I want to find out why. Um, maybe there's good reason. Maybe it's how we're educating students. Well, frankly, if we look at how schools of education have educated students nationally, there's a reason why a lot of people say blow up schools of education. <laughs> Some days I feel that, yeah, that I could see why you'd, people would feel that way. But at the same time, we know that's not how we fix things. We don't blow up schools of medicine. We don't blow up schools of law, apart from what people may want to do at times. <laughs> yeah. um, we fix it. We course correct. We innovate. And so the leading medical institutions, the leading law institutions, all innovate. The leading schools of education need to innovate. The, I mentioned earlier the partnership with Apple. We're looking to do or consider ways of looking at a one-to-one, -one, computer to student, from K all the way to master's students, all the way to graduate degrees. That's, a, that's very innovative. No mm -hmm. one has ever done that kind of work. And then find out what's working, what are the best practices along the way. Yeah. No, I agree with everything you said, Nick. And it is a challenge. I mean, this is not going to be easy. Like you said, if somebody would have already done it, it would have been done, right? I mean, but we're coming together as institutions with a belief that this can happen. And I keep hearing this failure is not an option. Well, failure is not an option because we don't, we, we can't afford failure here. Mm -hmm. And I think that if you invest in this concept, you're investing in people that are committed to this with a very unique structure where you have the teacher preparation program, you have high schools, we have a K-8, we have others like John Sobrato and others committing resources and also making this happen. So I think all of the elements are there. I've not seen anywhere else in the country that this is coming together. And I've been in education for over 40 years to have this. I'm besides myself just thinking about it. I get so excited thinking about it because all the elements are there and we're gonna make something positive happen here. And I, I'm just, it, this is just a dream come true for Absolutely. me. So it's exciting. Yeah, well I can certainly tell the excitement and uh, David, I'm ready to write the check. <laughs> <laughs> we're ready to take yeah, the check. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, just to wrap up here, any last uh, words for you? Here, we have about a minute left, uh, but any last words or anything that you want to say about uh, um, your collaborative? I guess I would say, you know, again, we've been very fortunate with the players involved. We've got um, the leaders in this collaborative have been very committed to the cause, and I, that's something you don't mm -hmm. often get. Egos aside, we get down and, and, get, and get the work done. You know, from my perspective, I'll say that we want to train your favorite teacher. That's who we want coming out. When you think of your favorite teacher, those are the teachers we want to be producing. Yeah, we want to transform things in teacher education, and education in general. Like I said, I've been involved in this for 40 years. I haven't seen a lot of innovation and transformation, unfortunately. So we want to be that entity that does that and, and make a difference in the community. So we're in position to do that, and I see us working together to make that happen. So transformation and innovation is in our DNA. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Nick and David, uh, congratulations again, and I wish you much success in this amazing collaborative, very much needed. Thank you very much for Thank being you, on the show Oscar. today. Thank you. Stay tuned for uh, next month.